Welcome back. Jimmy at the Crossroads coming to you in partnership with the Washington Examiner on this Wednesday, August 26th. So great to be with you today, as always, making sense out of nonsense, and especially when we have the opportunity to disagree with the guest, as I have no doubt we will do today with our second guest of this edition of the program. Michael Hiltzik is a columnist at the Los Angeles Times and one of my favorite liberal sparring partners, and he rejoins us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads to talk about the conventions and the Postal Service. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time today, sir. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. And By the way, I plug my new book, oh, which is right here. I didn't realize you had one. Go uh, ahead. What's the name? Today. It's called Iron Empires. And it's history of the original Gilded Age, which goes back to the 1860s and 1870s and, and the railroad robber barons of that era. So uh, you can buy it on Amazon or at your local bookstore now, anytime. Congratulations. You have authored many books. How many books so far, Michael Hiltzik, have you published? Uh, that's my seventh. And seventh the, book. Coming that's up cool. in 2024. Fantastic. Well, good good luck on that one. And, and in terms of the uh, Iron Empire's book, folks, be sure to check it out. It's certainly going to be an interesting perspective on the robber baron age of the 1800s here in the United States of America. All right, Michael. Well, good to be with you as always. So let me jump in to the topic of the conventions first, since that's what we were talking about in the last segment. Um what is your overall takeaway so far from the Republican convention and the Democratic convention last week from a stylistic standpoint and also from a content standpoint? Well, I didn't spend much time watching either one of them, um, but uh, clearly from what's been filtering out, the convention is um, uh, they put forth a number of policy initiatives the Republican convention heard any policy initiatives act. The Republican National Committee uh, uh, explicitly said that they weren't going to put forth policy. They were just going to say a vote for no. Uh, I'm not sure it's worth spending any time watching it, so I doubt. Once again, gremlins in the system today, it seems, here on Jimmy at the Crossroads, hoping all will work out well now as we continue with Michael Hiltzik, business columnist at the L.A. Times and author of the brand new book, Iron Empires. Michael, throw it back up on the screen for us, please, if you want to show your book so folks can know exactly what they're looking for. Iron Empires, modeled by the author himself right there, here as we continue on Jimmy. Jimmy at the crossroads. Good luck with the book, sir. So let me let me get back to Thank the you. Republican National Convention topic, and I, I appreciate you switching the medium of conversation here on the fly. Um, in terms of the RNC, just going to restate what you were saying before, please. Well, I, what I said was uh, uh, I didn't hear uh, much indication of policy statements or prescriptions from the RNC. And in fact, they explicitly said that they weren't going to have a platform this time around uh, beyond uh, re-electing President Trump. And I think uh, I and many other voters uh, would like to hear more than that. So, um, you know, it doesn't seem worth uh, many people's time to tune into it. So I would disagree in that I especially heard highlighting of things that had been done in terms of accomplishments that I hadn't heard from the Democratic Party in terms of what they had achieved, what they would like to achieve. I saw some of that in the I was I watched every well, not every minute, but most minutes of the last couple of nights of the Republican National Convention. And I was very struck by how much more policy I felt that there was compared to the Democrats, particularly when they were discussing things like the First Step Act and the economy and the uh, paycheck protection protection program and other things. Now, they weren't getting into depth. Of course, the convention isn't where you're going to get into the weeds on how a policy works. But I felt that there was noticeable discussion about not only some policy things, especially things that had been done over the course of the last three to four years to paint a picture of progress and success 
under Republican leadership. But I also felt that what they were emphasizing was that Republicans really are talking about those sorts of issues because I heard a good amount, not in every speech and not from every person, but a, a lot more discussion about policy than I was even expecting. Well, okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that except that um, you heard something I didn't hear. So, well, you didn't watch as much as the of the RNC as I as I did, though. So, but, but then again, I think you probably would have come away from a, with a similar perspective. Uh, uh, that's for sure. In terms of the Democratic convention, though, and the Republican convention, and what message it sends in terms of this political climate right now, in terms of how they're going about it, their messaging, their approach, their uh, what what, the, what their speakers are talking about, the way that they're presenting themselves. I mean, last week, just as one example, we talked about this with Washington Examiner reporter Mike Brest in the last segment. Last week, the Democrats, it seemed like it was more disjointed. They had people all across the country phoning it in with their videos and so forth versus the Republican convention, where you have had um, speakers that have alternated at one location, giving some sort of a coherent and cohesive idea. You had some speakers that were sending in video messages, and you had other videos that were interspersed. Um, and then you had the big difference, too, is that you had live audience for Melania Trump last night, the first lady. I would expect the same thing for Vice President Pence tonight and President Trump tomorrow night. And so I think that there were some noticeable differences there in terms of just the way in which they went about the production, which I found interesting. Well, all I can say about that is, so what? I mean, so, you know, I mean, we have videos from 50 states in the Democratic Convention we have, uh, you know, a couple of dozen people sitting around in the Rose Garden to listen to Melania Trump. Who cares, really? I mean, none of that really matters. None of that matters to voters. None of that matters to me. I, I can't imagine why it would matter to you. Well, I think I think it would matter to me for two reasons. Number one, when you have a live audience that's able to applause, um, provide applause for a speaker, that adds a different dynamic than somebody who's just in a, in a room speaking yeah, to the audience it, without without it without a crowd there. This is one of the reasons why I think that you you notice big difference just in terms of tone in general when people are not speaking at the massive convention hall. I was at the RNC in 2016 as an alternate delegate uh, from Colorado, and I think that there is. A, an energy that can come from when you have speaker uh, speaker addressing a live audience. But then also, in terms of the production value, I think it actually is very important in this modern day and age when people are watching things on television and expecting sort of a, a show and a narrative to be presented that's it's cohesive in programs that they watch on TV. I think if you can capture that for a convention, and I think the RNC has done an effective job at that, I do think that helps in terms of the appeal, in terms of what kind of a message and impression that it sends, especially to voters who are trying to figure out, uh, you know, how still they're going to vote come November or in the next few weeks as ballots start dropping. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. Uh -huh. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So just the one, one final question, just from a historical perspective, because I know you, you study a lot about American history in terms of these conventions, setting aside the politics and, and some of the pageantry and so forth of, of this current occasion, the differences between the DNC and the RNC. What do you make of this moment where we have conventions that are now, from a historical perspective, this year – are remote that are that are largely not in front of live audiences that are not like they have been for many decades here in the United States. Well, I think clearly this is a response to necessity. Um, uh, you can't bring together, uh, you know, several thousand people in a uh, inside room uh, where everybody is is basically breathing in each other's faces right now. I think what it tells you is that a lot of the pageantry, as you put it, uh, in the past was sort of a veneer over necessity. I mean, there wasn't any other way to achieve uh, the nomination process than to, to have it all happen at once and in one place. So we sort of papered that over or addressed that with, with balloons and ballyhoo and, and what have you. We don't need to do that anymore. And I think what certainly what the Democratic Convention has shown, and to a much lesser extent the the RNC, is that uh, all of that stuff can be dispensed with and replaced by something that's much more meaningful.
Mm. I you think know, that's what we're moving moving to. I, I, I'd be really yeah. surprised if the next uh, conventions four years from now don't resemble this year's more than uh, than past ones. Mm. That's interesting. See, having been to the RNC once, of Republican National Convention in 2016, as I mentioned, I was an alternate delegate from Colorado. I think one of the benefits of having that massive convention center type event is that you can energize folks in the base from across the country who show up, who become very enthused yeah, about there, what was going on. I mean, that, just, did, that did give me some energy no as a voter in, in, in 2016 from somebody who, myself, I was opposed to President Trump throughout almost the entire primary. Well, there, there's no evidence whatsoever that the conventions have any lasting energizing effect. I mean, we see cycle after cycle, maybe there's a bump, maybe mm -hmm. it's a sizable bump, maybe it's a little bump. But within a week or two, it's gone. So no, let me clarify what well, I mean. I don't mean the broader public or even the base watching on TV. Well, that's the I mean the people who happens. show up at the convention hall and are are there with the energy and the engage. I really think that that fires people up in a way that can be lasting. Certainly was for me, 2016. Well, the people who go to conventions or who are delegates or just bystanders are already fired up, or they wouldn't make the effort to go to fair enough wherever it is i mean east you know rabbit hash mm. wisconsin to go to one of these things so so th th it's not making a difference if it doesn't make a difference in the broader voter population then it doesn't make a difference Michael Hiltzik, our guest, business columnist at the Los Angeles Times. Let's shift gears here to a topic that has garnered a great deal of attention, and that would be the United States Postal Service. This is an organization in the federal government that is extraordinarily popular, according to polling among Americans. We have seen controversies of late um, because of different reportings about um, mail sorting machines that have been shut down, that we have seen uh, postal collection boxes removed, uh, things that, by the way, have been going on uh, for years. But one thing that we have seen now that is even more amplified is with mail-in voting where now you have a situation where states across the country are trying to implement statewide vote-by-mail systems. I'm in Colorado. We're the third state to jump forward with a statewide vote-by-mail beginning in 2014. On the whole, I will say it has worked well in Colorado. We have taken good precautions. We have built up a system that really does work, that has different safeguards that are in place. But as I've said on this program, it took years, years to build up to that point where we were ready to go ahead and do it and had everything in place, all our ducks in a row. Now you have a lot of states that are rushing to it. And my perception is that Democrats are trying to set up the Postal Service and Louis DeJoy, the Postmaster General, as sort of the fall guys for a vote by mail process this year trying to say oh if we just fund the postal service more then that's going to make sure that these vote by mail systems will go off without a hitch which i think is in and itself misleading that's my setup here but michael hiltzik of the la times what do you think's going on here with the postal service situation? well first of all uh the democrats aren't saying that at all nobody is saying that what they're saying is that um Basically, we want to be sure that the U.S. Postal Service actually is prepared to do the job that we expect it to do, and that, in fact, General DeJoy says they are going to do. Now, that being said, it's it's not a, a myth and it's not imagination that since DeJoy came into place, mail has been slowed down or it has slowed down. This is, uh, we have official records from the U.S. Postal Service documenting that. Um, and and that's, not only that, but obviously we have uh, anecdotal uh, reports and solid reporting, including from my colleagues here in L.A. who've been inside the postal distribution centers and have seen chaos. This is chaos that happened in the last couple of months now, the bottom line is, look, uh, you know, DeJoy, he appeared before Congress twice in the last week. I think in both cases, he put in a, a uniquely pathetic performance in which he showed that he doesn't really understand the Postal Service. He doesn't understand his job. And yet he bowled ahead and implemented changes 
in operations without, first of all, without uh, doing any sort of research to determine what effect they would have on various constituencies that depend on the Postal Service. And then he claimed that he didn't really know that this was going on, which is, first of all, either he's lying or he's just confessing to incompetence. Uh, okay. Now, you know, we have testimony from, from a former vice chairman of the Postal Board of, uh, uh, of Governors that said they had considered and, uh, you know, quite properly, a lot of the initiatives that have been taken in the last couple of months uh, to try to make the Postal Service more efficient. And they decided affirmatively to put them on hold until the pandemic was, was over and until after the election when there's going to be a unique strain on postal operations. We have a unique strain on postal operations from the pandemic. It's only going to get, get more burdensome in the next few months. And the Postal Board of Governors said, let's hold off on that until the smoke clears. And then DeJoy came in and he went ahead and did it without actually, according to his own testimony, uh, going back to the Board of Governors and saying, are you okay with this and should we go ahead and do it? Why would you undertake dramatic steps and changes in operations of an organization just at the point where the, the, the effect on the, uh, on, on the service is unknown and unpredictable? Why would you do that as, as a CEO of a corporation? Why would you basically shake up an, a, a corporation at the point when it's facing unique Okay, so a few things. Few things. You, you, you said a lot there. First of all, I know that the Democrats haven't literally said, oh, the USPS is going to be our fall guy. But here's the thing. Democrats have been overemphasizing, and, and I will concede that President Trump has been doing the overemphasizing the opposite in terms of risks of a vote by mail in Russia, in, in, in generally, broadly speaking. But in terms of the Democrats, they have been setting up this idea that vote by mail is resoundingly effective. It's going to be resoundingly effective in any state that tries it statewide. And I just, based on Colorado's experience, which has been very successful, but built on years of getting there, I think that that is a, a woefully uh, overestimate of what well, is again, actually the case with vote by mail. Is, but let me finish my let me finish my point here, because what I'm looking at here is the Democrats overemphasizing this idea of vote by mail working no matter what. And trying to say that, oh, my gosh, it is simply the it is the Postal Service. We need twenty five billion dollars to go to the Postal Service and then they'll be able to do their job. When Postmaster DeJoy says we have enough cash on hand to get us through this election cycle and to handle the mail in ballots as we've got it. And I believe that they do, especially based on Colorado's own experiences. But also in terms of the vote by mail system, there are a lot of problems when you're rushing it into place. And as the Democrats want, you do not include uh, signature verification, which is absolutely absolutely critical and has been a, a boon for Colorado's uh, Colorado voters to feel trust and confidence in the electoral process here in this state when it comes to vote by mail. They don't want that in the Democrat House bill uh, in terms of what uh, they would actually strip away any of these sorts of requirements for signature verification that states may want to or rightly have in place already. But what they're doing is basically saying, oh, vote by mail is great. If we just fund the post office, then things will be hunky dory and 100 percent. That is false. It is up to the state local right, election good. officials to manage their elections predominantly here. It is not the postal right. service that is the good. driver. Even in the in terms of vote by mail, you need to have the systems and, and processes and safeguards in place. All right. Look, first of all, it, it's simply incorrect that Democrats have said vote by mail is a slam dunk or that it's going to be. That is absolutely that the perception work. that's been given. No it, doubt. Well, uh, I don't care where the perception is. The fact is that Democrats haven't said that. What they have said they have implied is it. that it's it's important to do and that it is going to be a challenge. And to help help deal with that challenge, we need to have the Postal Service on board. We, uh, they haven't said, uh, you know, the, post, the Postal Service is interfering. They haven't said that the Postal Service is going to screw it up. What they've said is that it's going to be a complicated process in many states, mm -hmm. and we need everybody to pull together. No, we certainly they've been understating the that. Postal Service certainly don't need the Postal Service 
to be remaking itself on the bump when it needs to be helping. Now, we, we also have <coughs> official remarks from the U.S. Postal Service, from DeJoy's team, that says, uh, despite the, uh, tradition and practice, which says that postal mail, excuse me, election mail gets priority as first class mail, whether it carries first class stamps or not, we have the Postal Service saying, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to require that that election mail actually have the uh, paid first class uh, stamps. That's going to triple the cost of getting postal mail out, election mail out for many states. And that's that that looks like interference. And I don't know how you can deny yeah. that when you go from 20 cents a piece to 55 cents a piece. OK, so, so let's, let's talk about a, that. For that's a, a problem. So as uh, we, for. Yeah. Let me just jump in on that on that particular point, because I think it's a, it's a very important one that you're raising, Michael Hiltzik, again, our guest from the Los Angeles Times. So last November here in Colorado, I'm an Arapahoe County voter in the city of Aurora. Aurora's mayoral race was held up for several days uh, in terms of getting a final decision, particularly because there were, in, in the case of Aurora, there were a total of 828 ballots between Denver and Arapahoe counties uh, that were replacement ballots that arrived on election day. This is November of 2019. And in terms of this Aurora, Colorado election, there were 650 or so ballots that were specifically for Aurora under the auspices of the Arapahoe County uh, clerk and recorder, Joan Lopez. And one thing that happened here in that situation is that she did not plan ahead in terms of making sure that in order to get these replacement ballots in on time, they paid first class postage. It was something they still managed to get it there because the Postal Service said we need to make sure at a certain point it was recognized, hey, got to get there uh, on Election Day. Let's make that happen. But what they said is that they have always been advising that you make sure that you take those steps to guarantee quicker delivery. The Postal Service should have gotten uh, the request for first class mail in that instance. It was not a flub of the post office itself. They managed to actually get it there on Election Day, but they didn't pay for first class postage. And they also didn't monitor those ballots, make sure well, that the there was a, a, that, the, that they that they were tracking those ballots. So they would have been able to flag if there was an issue. My point is that was 2019, an off year election, an odd year election. And it was in a state where we have seen vote by mail work overall very well. And it shows that if a local official is not taking the steps themselves to ensure that ballots get there in a timely fashion, that can be a particular holdup. That has not always been the case that the post office is just going to make sure that it gets there and treat it as first class mail if you don't uh, uh, take the additional steps. Well, There's no guarantee. There's be, never been that guarantee. That happens to be incorrect. The fact yeah. is that we have a report from the Postal Service Office of the Inspector General that was issued late last year. Uh, in which the OIG looked at what the record was in the last election and in elections before that. And the inspector general said it is the practice of the Postal Service to treat all election mail as though it's that first class goal. mail, no matter what, no matter what class it's paid for. That's been the practice. And if that's now going to be different, that's a change and it's going to be an expensive change and it's going to hurt the process. So look, we have the Postal Service itself says, no, this is the way we've done it in the past. We've treated all election mail, ballot mail, as first class mail, no matter what is being paid for. So, you know, and, and in any case, the, you know, this, this episode that you're referring to underscores that, yes, it's going to be challenging and it's complex, even as you said, in a state that's been doing vote by mail for many years. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we need everybody to pull together and we we don't need a postal service that's in in operational and yeah. managerial chaos so, to be part of yeah. this the Process. Well, one thing that's important, though, is that, yes, it is a general practice, but that is not always guaranteed. And that's why it is up to election officials well, locally to make sure that they are taking the appropriate steps. It has never been absolutely uh, a guarantee, which is why we have had these sorts of delays on occasion. Sure, fair enough. But at the same time, what it shows is that there are a lot of different components to a vote by mail system. And 
why are the, the you know the the Democrats have been emphasizing consistently? Let's give twenty five billion dollars postal service, which they do not need at this moment in terms of cash on hand. They have it. One thing that Postmaster DeJoy made a point of saying is that we do have enough cash on hand to make sure that things happen the way they need to in terms of the election day. But when you're oh, when you're emphasizing the the uh, postal service funding as the issue, they have presented it clearly been presenting. We've talked about and documented in this program as a sort of panacea. They may not say that phrase or use that type of language, but that is clearly what they're implying. But I do want to go back to uh, the, the trends in history in terms of the Postal Service uh, time, timeliness and so forth. Let's put up pick one here. This is the Washington Post last week on um, the, the 19th. And they said that this summer's mail woes appear to be only slightly worse than they were last year, and the delivery may be more related to the coronavirus pandemic. And delivery woes were worse in the first part of 2020, just as the pandemic hit, than during the summer when compared with the same periods last year, which I think is an important distinction. Then let's also talk about the Postal Service in terms of the uh, box mailboxes that have been removed and also in terms of the mail sorting equipment that's been removed. Let's put up here a pick three. Uh, pick three. This is the Postal Service. Uh, a report on the Postal Service, 2015, August 26. Oh, my gosh. Five years ago today, Michael Hiltzik, amid a significant downsizing of the money-strapped U.S. Postal Service, the number of letters arriving late has jumped by almost 50 percent since the start of the year. The delays have become so serious that the Postal Service's watchdog issued an urgent alert earlier this month recommending that postal officials put all further closures of mail sorting plants on hold, sure, until service stabilizes. Which, by the way, DeJoy is now doing. You put up pick four. First class mail has gradually been traveling more slowly since the post, all, post office started closing dozens of mail sorting plants in 2012. These longer delivery times became the new normal. My point in bringing this up is that the mail sorting uh, removal of these mail sorting units. These machines is not something new. It happened under Barack Obama. We had repeated delays under Barack Obama. Now, it was not him overseeing it. I'm just saying it was during his presidency. The president isn't the one who appoints the postmaster general. But this kind of thing has been <laughs> happening under previous presidents, including Barack Obama, and there wasn't a peep. Yeah, let me let me just, um, you know, break it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the president doesn't directly... Uh, appoint the postmaster general, but the president has appointed every single sitting member of the Postal Service Four Board of Four Republicans, two Democrats. The majority yes. of the Postal Oversight Commission. And, and as we know, because we've heard it from members of the Board of Governors, Steve Mnuchin, the uh, Treasury Secretary, has called in Republican members of the Board of Governors for conversations. All right. So let's not pretend that this doesn't have, that, that DeJoy's appointment doesn't have Trump's fingerprints on it, because it does. Now, to go back to the points that you raised by putting you can't prove that. Those, uh, those articles up on the screen, yes, sure, there have been, uh, there have been um, uh, inefficiencies, there have been crises in mail delivery in the past, and every one of those, those posts that you put up shows that, that the remedy was to halt changes in postal sorting facilities and to restore closures in postal sorting facilities when they were part of the problem. So why hasn't DeJoy learned the lesson from that? And since we, do, we now know from postal service statistics that there was a slowdown in delivery uh, starting when he took over, uh, you know, why does he sit there before Congress and when he said, and when he's asked, are you going to restore the changes that you made? Are you going to put the machines back? Are you going to reopen uh, post office hours? Are you going to reopen postal sorting facilities? He says, no, I don't have to. There's no need. When obviously there is a no. need. And documents it, that you just put up on the screen, no. document. No, what, 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 what they document are two things. Number one, why it was reasonable to, to halt it at this point, to halt the expansion. Does it mean that you have to pick them back up? Uh, it also doesn't mean that what, what in terms of the slowdowns that have happened in the last couple of months, that they are specifically and solely because of that, uh, the mail sorting machine removals, which have been going on 
for years, including recently. And w that that's one point. Yeah, number but number two, right? point, num point number two, in terms of DeJoy and his appointment and, and Steve Mnuchin, should the Treasury Secretary be getting involved? No, I don't think he should be having conversations along these lines personally. But there's no there's no way there's no demonstration or proof that what Mnuchin said was you have to go ahead and appoint uh, Louis DeJoy specifically as the Postmaster General. And here specifically are the things that are going to happen. What it seems to me that he's doing based on reading articles that you've written, Michael Hiltzik, is that what, what Steve Mnuchin is looking at is trying to figure out a basis to say, stop giving Amazon a break. Stop giving Amazon yeah, but, these well, sorts of uh, benefits, well, which I completely disagree yeah. with him on, you know, but that's well, what we, this is about for him. That's well, nothing know, else. What we know from an internal investigation by the U.S. Postal Service, an internal investigation, Amazon does not get a break. It doesn't get a break that isn't warranted. It gets a break as a bulk shipper like I agree. all other bulk shippers. I agree. As you. Uh, you know, and, and as for Mnuchin's concerns or his involvement, he has no legitimate involvement whatsoever. The USPS is an independent agency of the federal government. It does not report to the Treasury Secretary or the Treasury Department. It I agree ha with you. It, he has no right to stick his fingers in there whatsoever. And if he doesn't, then what the hell is he doing calling these people in you know, if, if he's not going to do anything about it or has no legitimate reason, is this so that he's got pillow talk with his wife and he can say, hey, you know, here's what the board of Go here's what a postal service governor told me. No, he calls them in and he has discussions with them because he wants to communicate Trump administration policy to them. And that's utterly I think completely what, what he's trying to do believe. more than anything is get additional information including yeah, about Amazon. He, he I, I no think right it's about Amazon, he which has it shouldn't no right be. To that. I, no, I, so, so let me just it's say, I agree same. with you. Michael Hiltzik, I agree with you that the, the Treasury Secretary should not be getting involved in these ways. I agree with you that Amazon is doing nothing wrong. The post office is doing nothing wrong vis-a-vis -vis Amazon. For the last couple of years, I've criticized President Trump for, for his criticisms of the Amazon deal with the United States Postal Service. But at the same time, my my sense has been that that's what Mnuchin wants more than anything in terms of uh, these conversations has been information in a variety of different capacities. He, uh, he, he, now, he, no, he was trying to get Congress no to, right to, to enable him to have more authority, but he didn't have authority. He has he no right meetings. to that information in any capacity that he serves. He has no right to it, and it's utterly improper and illegal for him either to, to be involved. So let me go to a couple of quotes. Let's go back to the uh, Postal Service, though, the mail sorting machines and, and this trend over, over 2020. I'm going to quote, uh, as the Wall Street Journal editorial board does, uh, from a recent editorial, quoting Mike Plunkett, a recent uh, USPS executive, now leads the Association for Postal Commerce. You can find valid operational reasons for the actions taken by the Postal Service so far. In no way do I detect any criminality behind them, and I'm at a loss as to how one would reach that conclusion. Conclusion, remember, a criminal investigation was being looked into uh, by Democrats in the House of Representatives into Louis DeJoy. Also, Hamilton Davis, the president of the American Catalog Mailers Association, says, quote, they've been taking machines out of service for years now, and I've been encouraging them to do it more aggressively. I think that's a good thing for America because we don't want to pay for stuff that we don't need. Now, I would agree, and by the way, they've removed 12,000 collection boxes in the last five years. I agree that at this point they need to to stop because of the election and the perceptions and the concerns that we're, we're seeing. But in the long term, this has been a trend and I think an appropriate trend in terms of cost cutting measures. Yes. And the Board of Governors decided affirmatively that they were going to put that trend on hold until DeJoy came in and he re, re implemented it. So and what do you, and what do you explain the, the, May, the May 15th um, equipment reduction report? that was already planned ahead in May 15th, before, a month before he took office. I'm sorry. The, the U.S. Question? Postal Service, I'm looking at it here right now on my computer. So equipment reduction, May 15th, 2020, going through their specific plans for reduction in the coming months as of May 15th, before he took office. Yeah, and then he took office and he had the every plan was every to move forward with it. He needed to put that on 
told him, by the way, May 15th was after he was actually appointed, though before he, he took Right, before he took seat. office, though. Yeah, but, but, but still before he took office. My point is that this was something that was in motion. But Michael Hiltzik, let's talk about the future of the post office for just a moment. In terms of where we go from here, last year, the post office had $8.8 .8 billion in a shortfall. Four and a half billion dollars nearly of that was in overtime and uh, tardiness and different things along those lines. Um, and and this is a trend that has been going on for years and years. We've seen very little occasions where the post office has had uh, net profits in, in decades. Over the, over the decades, we've seen very little of that. Now, one thing that's keeping them afloat a bit are the packages, uh, what they've been doing in terms of this is one of the things that I think Going back to the point about Amazon, I think it's been a good thing that they've shifted more into packaging and, and giving um, bulk arrangements to companies like Amazon and so forth. But the reality is that the United States Postal Service has consistently been unsustainable in terms of its financial pathway. What do you think needs to be done for the future All right, more than just a $25 billion dollar bailout? All right. A couple of things. One thing that you didn't mention is the 2006 congressional law that said that they have to pre-fund uh, their uh, uh, health care costs for their retirees. This is a burden that no other federal agency and, in fact, no other cor no corporation actually faces. And as we know, because we've seen the numbers, if that mandate didn't exist, the Postal Service would be in the black for every one of the last six years. Uh, number two, you, you sort of skip over a, a basic principle, which is why should the post office or, or postal service be turning a profit? Who says? The fact is that this is a, it, it's a national service. It's a public service. It should cost what it costs to do. And if you wanted to turn a profit, then that means that sending a birthday card to your grandmother from Aurora, Colorado, to wherever she lives, whether it's Sitka, Alaska, or New York City, or Chicago, or Denver, won't cost 55 cents. It'll cost at least $5.15, or maybe $7, because that's what the private postal services charge to do this. And they charge by the mile. Well, uh, hold on, hold on. Right. Now, I'm going to stop you right you there. And, and, and I want to stop you right there because, first of all, you can look at Germany. You can look at the Netherlands. You can look at New Zealand. These are instances where they have partially or wholly privatized their postal service, and they are not outrageously expensive, number one. Number two, you know full well that the FedEx and UPS companies are not able to do first-class mail. They can only do the extremely urgent type of mail, for example, because of the change made in 1979. The United States Postal Service has a monopoly. So if you want to not go to the Postal Service for something because you want to get rush delivered through FedEx, or UPS, what do you do? Well, you pay more in order to get that particular service. So of course that might be more expensive, but there is no evidence when you look at those countries around the globe, for example, in Europe, the so-called socialist utopias in Europe, where they have done this type of privatization where it has been outrageously expensive and has failed to meet a universal mail mandate. Well, look, uh, Germany, we, you, you know, what you point to, I don't know what the exact comparison is, but I think Great in spot. terms of its borders, it's probably about, if it's as big as Texas or maybe Alaska, that's a lot. It's not like the United States. And if you are sending a piece of mail from Berlin to London, uh, it's going to cost you more than it costs you to send it from Berlin to Bonn. That's not if fundamental. You have the, look, it's not like one person's mailing. You would have millions of people that would be engaging in in this where well, you could cover the cost because more people are going to be using that service you were going to pay more paper. to send a first class piece of mail from where you are to anywhere else in the united states than you pay now and you were going to pay based on distance that's what and in fact you know this is not guesswork that's what when the Trump administration put out a report through its Office of Management and Budget in 2017 saying we should privatize the U.S. Postal Service. They said this was why. It's they so did the not US actually Postal suggest Service privatizing in that report. more for its basic services. All right. So if that's what you want, then sure, 
privatize the Postal Service, but you're not going to like the results, I guarantee you. In 2018, the, the commission put together in the Trump administration did not actually suggest privatization, Michael Hiltzik. It came short of suggesting privatization yes, of the U.S. I Postal Service. What? The, the Office of Management and Budget put out a report. They Not only the Postal Service, but but dozens of federal agencies that they recommended privatization. And they explicitly said we should privatize the Postal Service so that it can charge flexibly. The, the right? 2018, now, flexibly I, I looked at that. The 2018 report from the Postal Commission did not... Uh, did not suggest recommend the, the task force put together the did not suggest system. privatization, Michael. It it did not suggest privatization. There may be certain there, elements there, there, that have suggested that, but not not nearly enough. I think we should go. Let's put up the pick. I think we should uh, be listening to Jared Polis, governor of Colorado in 2001, wrote a, a paper for the Independence Institute entitled Privatizing and Eliminating the Monopoly of the United States Postal Service. And he's been a... a, a uh, an advocate of this now, fairly quietly, but an advocate of this going back uh, 19 years. And he talks a lot about some of these advantages and looks at the in the in his paper. He looks at the dynamics of the Postal Service and of providing mail services of, of various kinds and looks at the monopolies and the power and authority of the U.S. Postal Service and strongly recommends both demonopolization and privatization to put it on the kind of financial pathway that it needs to be and also to be more effective. And points then in that paper, again, Democratic now governor of Colorado, former congressman of Colorado, uh, Jared Polis, points out that when you do look at those other European countries, citing them as examples, they are instances where privatization has worked well and effectively. And while you can talk about some of the uh, the, the the issues of of uh, uh, being across the country, being a much larger country than the Netherlands or than Germany or New Zealand, absolutely, I will grant that. In terms of scale, you can make this kind of thing work. They do this effectively in terms of FedEx and UPS. Now, yes, those services can be more expensive as they are than what the post office provides because we're excluding first class mail. But when you look at the ability to provide service cost effectively, it absolutely can be done. All right. Let me just. Um, uh, I would like to back. see the Trump administration talk more about privatization, Michael Hiltzik. Right. I think that they are woefully um, inadequate in that regard. All right. I've got on my screen the reform plan from the Office of Management and Budget uh, of the Trump administration. This was issued on, um, let's see, in 2017, all right? And I'm uh, going to page 68 here, okay? Because I want to make sure I've got it right. And here's what it says about the Postal Service. A pro the, 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 this is under the headline, The Opportunity. And what it says is, a privatized postal service would have a substantially lower cost structure, be able to adapt to changing customer needs and make business decisions free from political interference and have access to private capital markets. The private, the, the, this, this, this proposal would restructure USPS by aligning revenues and expenses to restore a sustainable business model and prepare for conversion from a government agency into a privately held corporation. So we're we're talking about two different entities then, because I'm talking about the Treasury Department's uh, report from the task yeah, force on the United States Postal System, that, December 2018. December 2018. Uh, this, came from, this came directly from the Trump White House after he took over, and it directly says explicitly, restructure the Postal Service and privatize it. Well, I'm encouraged by that personally, but I was looking at the actual task force well, on you know, the United it, States Postal System that was created specifically to look at this. So what, what, what I'm saying is in terms of the actual task force that was created for the purpose of exploring reforms for the Postal Service, they fell short of calling for privatization. But thank you for telling me about the OMB report. I'm encouraged by that. I would like to see more direction uh, in that regard after this election cycle uh, in, in terms of that. But just just finally, Michael, um, when we when we look at the 
role of the U.S. government at this point in time in terms of, of services, in terms of what's provided, we have seen that the number of employees in the United States Postal Service has dramatically decreased uh, by nearly, I think, nearly 200,000, 300,000, uh, 250,000, somewhere around there in terms of the workforce over the course of the last two decades. Uh, we have seen that um, the number of first-class mail pieces that get put in the mail dramatically lower than what we had seen going into the 21st century. You talk about the 2006 health care uh, or the provision in terms of pensions where they have to prefund their pensions, which, by the way, I think every federal government agency should be looking at something like that. Every state agency, too, because we have all these massively unfen unfunded liabilities. But let's put one thing into perspective. The Postal Service offers something that you don't see, certainly not in the private sector, which is health care benefits for retirees. And that is something that we know how health care costs are in the United States of America. They're astronomical. Uh, it is certainly justified to say that an agency of the government should be looking at prefund if they're providing something like this. The solution isn't to provide some sort of a bailout or to eliminate the prefunding mandate. If you're not going to privatize the social, uh, the, the post office, what you should do is you should go ahead and get rid of or start phasing out for upcoming new workers that particular provision on the health care uh, in terms of the health care benefits. But also, they haven't paid into that system since 2012, as you know. So how do you say that these losses are attributable? When we know about first-class mail, we know that $4.5 billion was spent on overtime and late mailings and so forth in, in last year. How do you say that that is the driver? of the cost situation here with the Postal Service? Well, because because it is, it, it's not that they have to pay these these uh, these costs, it's that they had to accelerate the, uh, uh, the payment of those costs into a period of about 10 years, yes. rather than amortizing them as- And they, they stopped in 2012. The way, the way other federal agencies and private corporations do. So this was, and in fact, it was probably deliberate but it certainly put a unique burden on the U.S. Postal Service's uh, budget. And by the way, DeJoy, in his testimony before the Senate, endorsed repealing that provision. So he's he's with me, not with you. OK, fair enough. I think the provision that should be repealed is providing health benefits for new workers that come well, into well, the system. I think, that I think you should start, you should so start you there. Think, now, that doesn't help with some that, of the liabilities you, you have in the books. Postal service workers don't deserve to have health coverage? No, I'm talking about retirees. You don't see well, that in the uh, private sector. You don't see that in the private sector. Yes, you see it uh, it's private very sector. rare. It's very rare nowadays in terms of retirees well, getting health care benefits in the private sector. So, no, well, I don't think future uh, uh, postal employees should get uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of benefit. Why not? Because Why? because when you are leaving, especially when it's not happening in the private sector, you shouldn't be given benefits after you retire that are health care benefits. A pension, fine. Why? If you can maintain a pension, that's all well and good. Because, the, because your pre previous employer should not, especially if it's a government agency, government-tied enterprise, um, should not be providing health care benefits for you. You should be responsible Why for not? that after you retire or go on to Medicare. You, ser you serve an employer for 30 or 40 years and you should be cut loose after you retire? Where, where, what is that? In terms of health care, you should be encouraging workers to – uh, to stay within their own lane in terms of providing themselves. If they're going to retire early, they should be, especially if they were government employees, they should be providing. They should. They it's should. Early they should be. It's well, but if you if you get well, out you're later, them, you're going to leave them uncovered. Really? In terms of in terms of providing for your own health care, most people in the private sector nowadays do not have employers who are providing that. The government shouldn't. Why? Because they should. Like Why? literally, it is not the role of government to be providing people all of these sorts of benefits after they leave their jobs, especially that are not provided in the private sector, or rarely are. What, what? Why? Why? Because not? it's not the role of government. I'm telling you. That's it's not true. the role of government to provide health care benefits the role to retirees. To take, 
It's the role of when an they're employer working for you. Yes. Retiree. Fulfill promises. Existing employees who retire. Well, these were promises. They absolutely existing employees make sure to fulfill those. New employees that are coming in, you need to start phasing out these kinds of programs. Well, we're, we're not talking about the government. You know, this, this rule on uh, pre amortizing retiree health care is not about new employees or. It, it's about existing, existing retirees yes, and true, existing true, employees. True. This was promise made, and you, and you seem to be saying we should abrogate that promise. No, no, of, you're making a very of, important distinction, Michael, and and I've tried to I've tried to include that in there that I'm talking about future retirees. I'm not talking about, and so yes, you do have you do have an existing challenge well, on the books. Well, future retirees but, include future retirees include a lot of people. Who are working for the postal service today yes. and have no, well, and have accumulated workers, 20, 30, right. 40 years no. of service, yes. and they and they were hired according to. Uh, I agree. They were offered this promise at yes. the time. Yes. So I agree. I'm looking at new workers that come in. You're right. I need to be very cogent with my well, language not, there. So absolutely, it's important that, clarification. And then it still leaves us with all of these liabilities that are owed. And you still have the pre-funding that I said, because there are a lot of workers who are current workers who will be working in the Postal Service for many years. So I see your point there. But here's the thing. I don't think that that because Louis DeJoy, Postmaster General Michael Hiltzik, has said that he thinks we should get rid of this necessarily means that we should. I'm not saying that he's right in everything. I'm not saying that I agree that he should be agreeing with you on that particular point. I think that this is a government agency. Sure, it is quasi-governmental, but it is still nonetheless. It has a heck of a lot of authority, like they and they don't have to pay taxes for the most actually, part. They can avoid, for actually, the most part, for the most part. But but what I think here, in regards to the 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 role of this 2006 statute is that it is being overstated, especially because payments have not been made since 2012 in, un, in accordance with that 2006 statute, that you are overstating its role in the financial state of the Postal Service. Well, it is, it is first-class mail primarily and also these excessive costs like the $4.5 billion I was talking about. Jimmy, you, you misunderstand the impact. Whether they're paying it you know, as they should or not, the fact is that the... Uh, uh, that the cost of it accrues as a charge against revenue. So it shows up in the bottom line of the U.S. Postal mm -hmm. Service. And what DeJoy said was basically he acknowledged that that is a cause of the Postal Service deficit and that he wants that removed. Certainly contributing back to it. And, and it's not a mystery. It's in black and white. And it's two plus two equals four is that this particular burden and this obligation accounts for why the U.S. Postal Service has run a deficit in in the last six years. It is a contributing factor into it's that, deep, as Joy deep, pointed out. There are a number of reasons for why the Postal Service has had its problems over these years. And we know that, especially when you're talking about you look at the the significant decline in first class mail postage that has been used. But Michael Hiltzik, we have to run here. We've been at this for an hour. I really appreciate it. You are always uh, fun to, to dive into topics with, of course, columnist at the LA Times. Show that book one more time. Iron Empire's new book just came out from Michael Hiltzik of the Los Angeles Times. You're on Jimmy at the Crossroads. Michael, can you hear me? Yes. Can you show your book one more time? Want to oh, give a sure. chance to, to Absolutely. show the Iron Empire one more time. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, thanks for having check, me. Check it out. The book Iron Empires and his columns for the Los Angeles Times. Michael Hiltzik joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads for one of our longest segments that we have done here on this program. And we are out of time today. So great to be with you. Such a pleasure and a privilege. What a vibrant discussion. Got to enjoy it to be sure. You just watched a clip from Jimmy at the Crossroads. Don't miss more engaging, intelligent talk. Subscribe to the Jimmy at the Crossroads YouTube channel today. You want to catch our live show. And I love your support. I got Jimmy at the Crossroads. Megan sits out of no one. No sin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>